Romans chapter 5, it's right there on the screen. We're going to be looking at the first two verses. Uh, we might get out of Romans once or twice maybe today, but I've really tried to confine myself uh, and try to really simplify it and explain everything that I'm going to talk about from the book of Romans this morning, and uh, hopefully that'll help you. And I encourage you to follow along in the Bible, grab a Bible, take some notes. Uh, those are all great things to do to help uh, in your understanding. Uh, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to refer to some verses uh, in just introducing this message and just kind of getting you thinking about it. You don't have to turn to these uh, me uh, this morning. I'm just going to make a statement about them uh, by way of getting our minds trained in on what uh, I'm going to talk about this morning uh, concerning these verses that are behind you, uh, or behind me, rather, on the screen. Um, <clears throat> so, I hope you can follow along, and I hope that this will be helpful uh, to you this morning. So first, let me say that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent here by the Father, God in heaven, the creator of all things, so that whoever would come to trust in him would be saved by him and by faith in him. John chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, if you want a reference. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the means of salvation, which is made possible by the love of God, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, by the grace of God, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8, and by the kindness of God, according to Titus chapter 3 and verse number 4. Salvation is offered to us not on the basis of our performance or our perceived goodness, but rather on Christ's performance on the cross of Calvary and on his goodness, which he was good all the time, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse number 16. So I want to talk about Romans chapter 5 this morning, these first two verses. And really, there's a lot more to talk about after the first two verses, but I tried again. I tried to keep this concise, and I'm going to explain these two verses to you in hopes that that will be a blessing and a help to you. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Let's stand together and read these verses together. Uh, maybe we could probably quote them together, maybe if you tried. <clears throat> Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. There are blessings, specifically three, but we could see four that I'm going to talk about this morning found right here in these two verses, and we're going to talk about it. Let's pray first. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his shed blood and his offer of salvation. And, and Father, his performance, we could not do it. We can't do it. Uh, it is his good, not our good, that would offer salvation or would gain salvation for anyone. And so, Father, we praise you and thank you for providing all of that and pray that you bless now as we examine, as we consider these blessings that can only come by faith in Christ uh, and only come through his work and his offer of salvation. And we ask for this and, and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Have a seat. So here in Romans chapter 5, and we notice right away in verse number 1, therefore being justified by faith. I want you to think about that word justified because that's a big word. And that word has some big meaning, some big implications. That there's a lot wrapped up into that word. And again, I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can this morning. But therefore, being justified by faith, I want to focus on that. And that word justified, if I could just simplify it, say it in another way, it means to render, that is to show or to regard as just or as innocent. What does that mean? That means because of what Jesus did and by faith in what Jesus did, we can be declared innocent by God. Now, I hope you understand that there's not a one of us that's innocent. And I'll get to that in a moment, and I'll show you that. But 
That's what that word justified means. That is probably the biggest blessing, in my mind anyway, that's one of the biggest blessings of this whole deal, that God would look down to me because I trusted in his son, because I put my faith and confidence in what Jesus did for me. Because of that, and that only, God says, Jim Kiefer is righteous. He's justified. Everything that he's ever done wrong, forgotten. Because he accessed by faith Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's, it blows my mind to think that God would do that and would set it up that way. But that's exactly what God says that he did. All right? In other words, through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be declared righteous by God. Not by somebody else, not by me, but by God. And not only by God, think about this, by God's standards of righteousness. Now think about that. Now that's a hurdle that we would never be able to get to on our own. We were declared righteous by God and by God's standard of righteousness and why is that? I'll tell you why. Because my faith is in Jesus Christ and what he did. And when God looks down to think about Jim Kiefer, he doesn't see Jim Kiefer anymore. He sees what his son Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and his shed blood that covers all of my sin. That's what God does. And that's what that word justified means, right? I just simplified a whole lot of Bible right down into one couple of sentences there. But the blessing is that even though we are absolutely, most definitely not right, or righteous for that matter, <laughs> on our own, or ever could be on our own or by our own merits, there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to make sure my good works outweigh my bad. Good luck with that, friend. That doesn't happen, and it doesn't work, right? It won't work. It can't work, because according to the Bible... Uh, if you obey the whole law yet offend in one point, it's like, it's like driving on the interstate at 100 miles an hour. Well, I obeyed every other traffic uh, law and every other thing. Well, yeah, but you're still going to be in trouble, right? We, have, we are lawbreakers, and we have offended God. I'm, and again, we'll get to some Romans verses here in a minute uh, that show that. But the point is, God looks at me and says, justified. Well, it's not me. I know. You know who's, he, who's he talking about? Because he's not talking about me. He says, no, 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 you. I'm talking about you, Jim Kiefer. You're justified because of faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of what I see or saw in your life, but what I see on your life, which is Jesus and his blood and his robe of righteousness, if you will. All right? So God has provided the way to restore us to a righteous position through his son on the cross of Calvary. That's what justified means. That's what that phrase, therefore being justified by faith, that's what that means, all right? And so let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and so notice this with me. If Jesus can justify anybody he wants to, all right, think about that. Jesus can justify anyone who comes to him in faith, calls upon him in faith. Hold your finger in Romans chapter 5, back up a page or so, maybe mine's on the opposite page there. Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Romans chapter 3, 22 and 23. Again, we could read the whole chapter. We're not going to do that this morning. Look at these two verses. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, notice, unto all. Is anybody here doesn't fit in the all category? No, no, no. You all fit in the all category, right? Unto all and upon all them that believe. All you got to do is believe. And you fit into the all. All of them that believe fit into that category and can, by faith, 
receive the righteousness of God. It says, for there is no difference. So yeah, there's a lot of difference. You're ugly and I'm not. But, there, but in God's eyes, listen, by the way, there is no ugly in God's eyes. He created you exactly the way you are. Ladies, you don't have to change your hair color to be beautiful. If God made you with that hair color, he said, that's beauty right there. Right? You don't have to paint the whole face up and pretend to be somebody else. God made you that way. You're beautiful just the way you are. Fellas, good luck. <laughs> Need all the help you can get. Hey, listen. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Notice verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, here's the thing. I said this a moment ago. It's not by me and it's not by you. When God says, I'm righteous, I'm justified, he's not saying, well, he's a pretty good person, so I'm going to justify him. No, no, no. He, he knows this. I am a rotten person. I am a wicked person. I am a sinful person. The Bible says so. And in spite of that, by faith in Jesus, I get to be declared right and righteous by God, by his standards. That's a blessing that this verse tells us about. The good news that we find in this passage is that it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what you've done. God is offering you, if you believe on Jesus and call on his son Jesus, to be declared right, to be forgiven of everything as long as you come through Jesus Christ. That's what it says. I want to share with you another aspect of this truth. You're in Romans chapter 3, right? Look at verses 24, 5, and 6. Just continuing on there. It says, for, uh, verse 23, uh, 23 again, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Notice verse 24 again mentions justified. Being justified, notice, freely. <laughs> you can't buy this. You can't pay for this. By His grace, not your grace, you are justified freely by His grace through the redemption, notice, that is in Christ Jesus. It's not in Muhammad. It's not in Confucius. It's not in anybody else. It's not in me. It's not in you. It's only in Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, there's a lot to unpack in that verse, but let me try to simplify it for you, all right? We are justified or can be justified freely by the grace of God through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word redemption, it's the word that I was talking about earlier. We've been redeemed, that is, God came down, and he said, I know Jim Kiefer's messed up his whole life, and I had, friends. I, I don't have time to get into my testimony this morning, but it was messed up. <clears throat> wow. That's all I can say when I think about what God did. But when he looked down at me and he says, man, Jim Kiefer needs some help, I am going to shed my blood and apply it to his account so that he doesn't have to die for what he's done. He redeemed me. He purchased me. He bought me. He paid my debt in full. That's what that's talking about, and praise God for it. And he only did that through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. For the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God said, you know what? I could kill him, and I'd be right and justified in doing so. I was guilty. And the wages of sin, the Bible says, Romans 6, 23, is death. I deserve to die right there and then. Uh, but that's not what I got. What he offered me instead was salvation, forgiveness, justification, only through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, his shed blood, all right? So Jesus, notice this, Jesus can justify us 
because God sent him to do so. It, the word propitiation, that's a great big word there. Let me, let me explain it. That means he put him on the cross instead of me. And it means he died in my place. I did the sin. And you know this, if you do the crime, you do the time. That's what the saying is. But in this case, God the judge sent Jesus the Son to die on the cross, to shed his blood, and he took my place. And he took his blood and he applied it to my account and said, paid for. The debt is paid for. He no longer owes anything. He is free to go. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26 goes on to say, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, not my righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, that he, Jesus, might be just and the justifier. What word are we studying? Just. We've been justified. Jesus was just. He didn't do anything wrong. That He could not be accused of anything. He died a just man. But he's the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. I stand before you this morning saved, righteous. You say, no, 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 I know you. Yeah, 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 but so does God. And he declared me, whatever you might say about me, and whatever Satan might say about me, God says I've been justified. And you got nothing on me. I'm talking about good news this morning. Let me point out one final thought here about Romans chapter 5 verse number 1 and that phrase, therefore being justified by faith. Jesus can justify us because he shed his blood, his sinless, righteous blood. Uh, Romans chapter 5, look down at verse number 9. Romans chapter 5 verse number 9. Notice what it says, much more than being now justified, that's what we're talking about, about by what his what? Blood. We shall be saved from wrath, the wrath of God, notice, through him. Jesus can justify us. He has the legal right to justify us. He has permission by God the Father to justify us because he shed his righteous blood and he can apply it to my account and declare me righteous. By the way, that's why the Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Why? Because the blood hadn't been applied. If you try to go through some other religion, some other organization, some other means, some other method, it won't work. Because God set Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. He didn't send Muhammad to be that, Confucius to be that, or anybody else to be that. He sent Jesus to be that. And so he can justify us according to the God of the Bible. He has the opportunity, the privilege, and the right to justify us, to declare us right and righteous by God's standard, right? So let's look back at our text again, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And I want to explain another blessing we see here in this passage. It says in verse number 1, Therefore being justified by faith, here's blessing number 2, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ is what it says. So not only are we declared just, righteous through Jesus, but also at the same time and by the same move, we have made peace with God. You say, well, I don't understand why why do we need peace with God? Look back at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 10. Jump down to verse number 10. The Bible, Jesus explains himself in the Bible. The Bible explains itself, right? Verse number 10 in Romans 5. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled. That means brought back together again, right? You reconcile your checkbook. You make your checkbook say what the bank says most of the time. 
We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He didn't just die and go to the cross, go to the cross and go to the tomb. He came out of the tomb and went back to heaven. So the fact that he lives again is evidence that all of what I'm saying is fact. The empty tomb proves, some of the atheists have said, well, what, what, why is everybody talking about the resurrection? Because the resurrection is proof. Did Muhammad resurrect? No, he, they still got his bones. By the way, all the popes, they still got their bones. I, in fact, when I was in Italy, I went and saw them. You don't need to. It's, it's not that great, all right? I'm just saying. They're bones. All I'm saying is this, Jesus Christ is the only one that has the permission and the place of God that can do this. And because of what he did, he has made peace with us. Now, you all know what's going on in Israel, and you see the writing on the wall. It's, there's never been peace. And the Bible says we should pray for peace in Israel, and we will. But I can tell you when it's going to happen, when God wipes away all their enemies. Now, they don't think that's going to happen. But listen, I read the end of the book, and I know it's going to happen. They are just mounting up an attack in which Jesus is going to come wipe them all out. I told you I was going to be simple, so let's get back to it, all right? I almost got, I almost got off on a rabbit trail. Somebody shoot it. Somebody shoot it. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This happens because, as I said earlier, God sent Jesus to put, be put in our place to pay our penalty for our sin. And this is where I want to, I, I'm going to digress. I'm going to step away from the book of Romans for just a second. Turn back to 2 Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians, it's to the right. If you're in Romans, just go on back a little bit. You find 1 Corinthians, then you find 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul uh, is writing here. He wrote to uh, the book of Romans. The Holy Spirit had him write the book of Romans. Now he's writing to 2 Corinthians. In chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, I want you to notice what he said in verse 21 because he explains it uh, quite well. It says, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, he knew no sin, that we, the knowers of sin, the, the doers of sin, might be made righteous, the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus. Understand that we were enemies, according to Romans 5.10. Before we trusted in Christ, called on Christ, came to Christ, we were enemies because of our sin. We didn't just offend God by what we did and were doing. We were acting as enemies of God, right? You know what an enemy does. They confound you, they confront you, they violate you, they, they offend you, they are opposed to you every turn of the way. I, was, uh, I, I caught a story. I, saved, I think I saved this story as an illustration. I'll just tell it to you now because it's fresh on my mind. There was this fella, uh, retired military guy. Uh, I don't remember what branch, doesn't really matter. Uh, he retired in a small town. Uh, bought him a house, had a little backyard. Uh, it was kind of a rural setting, but you know there was a, a strip of houses. He had most of his land was behind him. He had a big backyard, and he was just living in retirement, having a great time. Uh, and uh, and w one day he decided uh, that he wanted to get in a hobby. He didn't want to just sit in the house all the time. So he, with, with all these drones, and I'm not talking about male bees. I'm talking about these objects that you fly, right? he's going to get into flying drones. So he got him one, and he started flying in the backyard, playing with it. And uh, one of his neighbors took exception. They, they had just moved in. He said, what do you think you're doing? Well, I'm, I'm just playing with this toy that I got, this drone. I'm, you know, just retired. I got nothing to do. I'm sitting around every day just flying this drone. Well, you can't fly that drone in the backyard. Why not? It's my backyard. Well... Uh, 
she said, you can't, because that drone has a camera and you might look into my yard. Well, you're not, you know, doing something you shouldn't over there, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just flying a drone. I mean, I'm not, whatever. You know, the other neighbors don't have no problem with me flying this drone. So anyway, he tried to, you know, be nice about it, but this lady just kept up. And then eventually she said, you know what? I'm going to fix his wagon. Has your enemies ever said that about you? I'm going to fix their wagon. She figured out a way through her device to connect to his drone. And every time he took off flying it, she'd say, watch this. And she'd do something and he'd crash. And he'd go to playing with it and she'd, boom. And he's there, well, I don't understand what's the matter with this thing. It, it was working fine the last time. She finally called the news crews in. This is how I found about it, because it was on the national news. <coughs> Come across my headlines. And the news lady's there doing an interview with this lady because she's the one complaining. And she's like, this guy is so bad, he's just over there. And I can see as this news report's going on, she's going, I don't think he's the problem. Because she went over and interviewed him, and he's like, well, yeah, look, I'm, I'm just having a good time. I'm not recording anybody, not doing anything. And, and all of a sudden, poof, it crashes. And he's like, well, I don't understand. And so he takes off again, poof, it crashes. He's trying to explain to the news lady, well, I don't understand why this keeps happening. And the news lady already knows because she's done talk to the neighbor. Now, I'm talking about an enemy working to subvert and working to, to oppose you. By the way, that's who Satan is for us. Aren't you thankful we have Jesus who died on the cross, sent by God? He was put there to be in my place, shed his blood, and apply it to my account. If I come to him, all I got to do is come to him, call on him, and trust in him, and all of a sudden, all of these benefits apply to me automatically, even if I don't understand them all right? What a blessing, right? Let me tell you about the third blessing, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Romans 5, verse 2. And we'll kind of tie all of Romans 5, verse 2 together because there's actually a couple of things here uh, that uh, ought to get you worked up. The third blessing that I see, notice it says, uh, verse 2, by whom also, so there's an also there, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access by faith. Grace, by definition, means favor. God is showing us favor through the Lord Jesus Christ. That means goodwill. Again, we've already read this. We've already seen this. We were the enemies of God. When was the last time you were nice to your enemies? Or your enemies were nice to you? It usually doesn't happen. Our enemies want to oppose us, right? That's what's happening all over the world these days, right? Is, and they're not showing us goodwill. When your enemy comes to you and says, here, I got something for you. How about you try this? Normally, my response would be, oh, thank you. I'll, I'll pass. I'll find my own, right? I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to drink that, right? People die that way. But God, who we were acting as an enemy toward, reached out in favor. That is grace. He reached out in goodwill. He demonstrated kindness by sending Jesus Christ. Uh, the definition, if you wrap it all up, would, would go something like this. The free, unmerited love and favor of God. In other words, consider how good God's been. In the fact that if we come to Jesus Christ, call on Him in faith, we will be forgiven, justified, justified and be at peace with God in spite of the fact that we are in fact guilty, we're sinners who by every right, by every law deserve to be punished. We 
are faulty. We are an offender. We've offended God. You say, how have I offended God? By our thoughts. God knows every one of your thoughts. That ought to embarrass us. He knows every one of our words. In fact, by the way, he's jotting them down. The Bible says that we will be held accountable for every idle word that we've spoke. I mean, even a word kind of spoken off the cuff. You know, sometimes we say, well, I didn't really mean that. God wrote it down anyway. Well, we're in trouble. Outside of Christ, we're in big trouble. But the grace of God, we have access to God's grace, His goodness, His kindness, His favor, His unmerited love. We have access to that by faith in Jesus Christ. And outside of that, there's nothing but wrath. You say, well, that doesn't sound like a loving God. A loving God made a way so nobody had to enter into wrath. The only person mandated into the wrath of God, think about this, is Satan himself. Satan himself. God created hell. I'm not going to go there. There's a Bible passage on this. God created hell for Satan and his demons. They're the only ones designated to the wrath of God. To all of us human beings, he offered his grace through Jesus Christ. That's how good God is. Did he have to? No, we were all offenders. We were all following Satan. We were all doing, but he said, no, no, no. Let me interject here, and I'm going to demonstrate my grace. I'm going to put my son on the cross. I'm going to let him shed his blood. I'm going to let him die in their place. And if they will come to me, I will forgive them entirely. Doesn't that sound like God is being good to us? In my opinion, I, I don't know if that doesn't sound like anything I'm familiar with on this planet Earth. We deserve death, and we deserve hell because we've offended God, and we've violated his commandments. But through the faith of Christ and through our faith in Christ, we don't have to have neither one of those things. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter number 8. Notice what it says starting in verse number 1. We'll read two verses. We could read all of it, but we'll just read two verses. There is therefore now no condemnation. How much is that? None. Zero. Nada. Condemnation. What is that? That's guilt. Right? That's penalty. That's punishment. That's, that's something that we all don't want. There is thou, uh, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. See, here's the other side of this. Some people say, well, I'm just going to live the Ten Commandments and everything will work out fine. Friend, you've already failed to live the Ten Commandments. You've already messed that deal up, and you haven't even made it yet. You say, what do you mean? Did you obey your mother and father unconditionally as you would God? No, that's what it says in the Ten Commandments. You've messed it up, and you're not even an adult yet. It's a good thing God sent Christ. Hey, I I'm just going to live the Ten Commandments. You can't look on the opposite sex without lusting. Don't do it. And God knows your thoughts. Oh. In this day and age, that'd be tough to do. I'll just be honest with you. We've already messed up. Hey, listen, don't use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Don't take anything that doesn't belong to you. I'm giving you the condensed version. But you get the point, don't you? We can't do it. By the law, 
we'd be dead men. And that's why we have access into God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the blessing that God offers us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we have to be thankful for. That's why we ought to have joy in our hearts. That's why we ought to rejoice and we ought to follow God uh, and live for God with everything we got because unless God did what he did and sent Christ, we'd all be condemned to die right now and there would be no way out of it. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay? That's the last portion there. It says we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You know, I, I hope. I asked God to help me with this this morning. God, help me just to glorify you. Help me to lift you up before the people. Help me to tell them how wonderful you are for giving us this gift, for providing us this opportunity. That's what glorifying God means. It means lifting him up and telling everybody how great he is. I'm going to tell you, we have a great God. He's greater than any other false gods. He's greater than any other named God, named or unnamed. He is a great God because of what he's done. And it's all through Jesus Christ. And that's why salvation is only through Jesus Christ and can only be through Jesus Christ because he's the only one that's died in our place and the only one that can. He's the only one sent to do so. So in Christ, there's so much to be thankful for this morning and to praise God for. So my question, and yes, I'm finished. My question is this. Have you accessed God's grace through Christ and through faith in Christ? Have you experienced the blessings of God and being justified by God through Christ? And if not, what on earth are you waiting for? It's the greatest thing I've ever experienced in my whole life. Some people say, well, I just want to go have fun and party. Listen, partying has nothing on this. I did that. I tried that right? I don't know anything about bending over the, the, the puke bucket that was more pleasant than this. This is so much better than anything I did in the world before I knew Christ. I can't wait to see him, to fall in my, on my face at his feet and say, thank you, for loving me enough to do that for me and forgive me and justify me and declare me right. Boy, I, I, don't, I don't think it'll make sense when I get there. It certainly don't make much sense now, but that's what it tells me. And by faith, I believe it. I'm counting on it. Let's stand together. Again, my question this morning in closing for our invitation is this. Have you, as a person, maybe your parents did, good for them, but it, your parents can't do it for you. Your preacher can't do it for you. Man, if I could do it for you, my name would be Jesus Christ, and I would have already done it. Jesus has done it already. But we have to receive that and come to him and call on him is what the Bible says. And if you want to learn how to do it, I've got counselors. You can ask questions. They can answer those questions and show you what the Bible says in full detail as long as you want to ask, ask questions. If you haven't placed your faith in Christ for salvation, why not? Right? And if you haven't, don't understand yet, I want you to know that that's, that's a, a fine reason. But boy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that persist because... Man, the world today is telling me everything I see. This book is full of prophecies. There was a lot of them fulfilled in Christ, in his life, in his, in his birth, in his life, and in his death, his resurrection. Fulfilled, as I preached about and taught about at Christmas time. But there's a lot more prophecies that refer to his second coming and what's going to happen in the end. By the way, 
That's what's going on in Israel right now. I guarantee you, I, it's there. It's written and recorded, and they are setting the stage up right now. Sometime I'm going to preach about that, but I'm not quite ready yet. There's just so much. There is no good reason to not trust Christ. But there's plenty of very good reasons to trust him. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your love for us. Thank you for sending Christ to die in our place, to take our punishment, our penalty, and our shame upon himself. And Father, you offered us the gift of everlasting life through Christ. Have all our sins forgiven, to be declared justified, to be declared righteous in your sight and by your standard. And Father, I pray that you'd save those that aren't. I pray that you'd help them to put their faith and trust in Christ today as their Savior. I pray that you would continue to draw folks to yourself and add them to your church as such as should be saved. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.